So uh, I've had some people reach out and I want to mention something kind of the beginning of class. So originally, I think the syllabus has the date as the midterm at the end of this week. So since we've kind of kind of based off of how we've progressed and kind of losing a little bit of time that one or we lost that one day. I think I'm going to push it forward. And after class today, I'll post kind of a, a practice midterm and some problems that we'll start going over. I think the new material this week, we'll probably get through a lot of it today. So we'll kind of finish it up on Thursday and then begin doing some review problems on Thursday. I'll also do some review problems next Tuesday. So I'll put an announcement up on Canvas, but the date for the exam will then kind of be over three day period of next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So I'll do it through Canvas. It's gonna be kind of like a, a take home it's mostly short answer with the exception that once you start it, you only have like an hour and 30 minutes to submit it. I don't know if that's the exact time I'll use yet. I'm still kind of finalizing the exam, but it should be around there somewhere between an hour and 15 and hour and 30 minutes. So that'll be available Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. That kind of covers over our class period Thursday. So instead of introducing new material Thursday, our, um, I'll, I'll basically, if we have any review, review problems left from those midterms, I'll kind of show up and just continue to, to work through those or, or work on any additional questions you might have that Thursday. So if you don't want to take it before that last kind of review, that's okay, right? You'll still have the rest of the day Thursday and then all day Friday to log on and, and take that exam. So it's really up to you. We shouldn't have to be covering too much additional stuff that Thursday, but just because, you know, I'm available during this time slot and I know you guys are. If you do want to meet and have last minute questions, it's kind of like more of a uh, uni universal office hour where we can kind of just, you guys can kind of bring your questions during that time as well. Okay. Any questions on that? Like I said, I'll, I'll have more um, like exact number of questions and exact time um, next week. I'll likely announce that on Tuesday when we meet kind of exactly how long the exam will be, but it will be over that three day time period. Any other questions for me before we kind of get going? And one of the reasons why I'm doing that as well, uh, Tuesday, because your, your homework assignment is technically due Tuesday. I know a lot of you've already started working on that, which is good. That frees up your time to, to start looking at those practice materials even easier once I post them after class today. Uh, it will also, I'll put up a, an answer key to that exam review is, well, I'll have it set to release basically at midnight so that you can start to see the answers for that homework too and have an additional study, study material or, or study resource there as well, okay? All right, so the new stuff that we have though today, we'll be uh, reviewing some concepts, let's see, that maybe you remember from 201, um, but putting a kind of the, the spin on We'll put a little bit of a spin on them. So the first thing we'll start talking about is just the idea of public goods. Okay, so a public good, you know, can we consider a stadium a public good, right? Once it's built, right, anybody can use it, right? It's non, it's non excludable, right? As long as you want to you know, purchase tickets, but also the benefits that stadium could have to the nearby area are non excludable. So that if building a new stadium in a city increases the, the revenue of the bars and the restaurants around that, which mean they can pay their employees more. So potentially we see income, income increases, employment numbers increase. That's non-excludable. Right? Once it's built, those effects will occur. It's non-rival in the sense that there's several people who can enjoy the benefits of that stadium being built in their city, right? Several restaurants, several you know, bars, employees, you know, et cetera. Tickets are not a public good, right? Because you have to still spend money to go attend the game. But these additional benefits that could exist to the city that come from having that stadium located in it, right? Those are what we're thinking about is this public good. Okay. So, you know, tickets are definitely rival. As soon as I buy a ticket to a seat, no one else can buy that one. Potentially there's some, some pride, right? Or some additional utility that can be, be gained, not through like economic kind of measures, but just purely being like a fan or kind of having some, some pride in that team. That's also a public good, right? Many people can enjoy it and it can't be, you know, you can't exclude people from enjoying that, that pride or, or that additional benefit of living in a, a city with, you know, whatever team, you know, 
team you're thinking about for whatever league, right? So, you know, this is thought of, and, and you, know, you could choose any example here, but Boston may, you know, anyone who lives in Boston may generate some additional benefit or utility from having the Red Sox or the Patriots located or associated with their city. Um, even you could kind of extend this out to small town fans, but that's, that's not huge. So what are some other potential benefits? So I already mentioned the economic gains to a city, right? This boost in, in local revenue could be see a, a boost in local employment because of that. And so how do we want to think about these stadiums in terms of being a public good? Well, public goods are going to be once something is built, there's, it's you know, non-excludable. Other people who didn't pay to build the stadium can enjoy some benefits from it. So, I think here I have negative externality, but I want to focus on the positive externality. First, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And apparently I forgot my animation here. So we'll eventually, you kind of see where we're going, right? So if we have this positive externality, this is going to be an additional benefit to someone who isn't a consumer or a producer in that market. So even if I'm not supplying the tickets or I'm not purchasing the tickets to attend games at the stadium, I'm still benefiting from the stadium just existing in my city. Right, this could be like the, the person who works at the, or, you know, one of the bars or restaurants, right? It sees an increase in income. So a lot of examples we usually use is like um, having positive externalities for things like education, um, our uh, national defense. Right? A, lot of, a lot of times we think of these are things that the government is kind of somewhat orchestrating or somewhat has a hand in, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be the case, right? We could think about with these new stadiums being built the new businesses, jobs, incomes that, that it's gonna generate for the city, these are positive externalities, okay? Whoops, so what was, oh, I'm gonna to switch to the dot cam here. So what is this gonna look like in terms of, of our market, right? Okay, so if we think about even the number of games, right? that are being played within a city. Oh. You think about here, you can measure something in this, this dollar amount. To the people that attend the games, they'll have some marginal benefit. And to the team that's supplying the number of games, even if you wanna make this a, a vertical kind of supply, um, right, they have to, to play 16 games or whatever the, the league is it's not gonna change much. So we'll just think about it kind of, if we have a general kind of increasing supply curve, right, to providing additional number of games. If there's positive externalities, that means that at each game played, right? So let's say we look at the very first game. We could look at whatever game, right? The value of that first game, or kind of the, the price that the city might be willing to pay for it, well, all of the consumers in that city would value at this amount, right? This demand curve reflects every single consumer of NFL games, let's say, in that city. Well, basically, those will be the marginal benefits of the people who go to those games, attend those games. Let me draw this in a different color. Right? But our kind of social marginal benefit curve, right? we can think of that's gonna include the marginal benefit plus this externality, right? right? There's gonna be some additional benefit to the city, call this kind of our externality, from that game being played in the city, right? On that day, brings in a lot of additional people into the city. So potentially there's this, these additional benefits that exist to restaurants and bars in the area. And so we're going to have a social marginal benefit curve that's higher than what we'll call the private marginal benefit curve, right? Just the people involved in kind of attending, attending these games. Like I said, you could do the same thing, but draw kind of a vertical, do it, look at the ticket market and think about, you know, as we sell more tickets, maybe if there's positive externalities, what would exist there? But basically what we arrive at is if we let the market decide, all this, the kind of number of games being played in the city. But for society, their marginal benefit curve is way out here. So they would actually like kind of this, I guess we could call this um, the number of games society would want. So you can kind of see the result is that because there's all these different positive externalities that exist, 
but to people that aren't involved in deciding how many games get played in this city, the number of games is going to be lower than what is socially optimal. Okay. So the result of a positive externality is the number of games that are, are played in that city is lower than what is socially optimal. Okay. Any questions on, on this market? Okay. So that's kind of where, let me, let me zoom in a little bit here as I'm talking. Okay. So that's where we see kind of the result being that too few games are being played, right? This city, and you could even break this down, maybe not just the number of games. You could think about uh, as a city adds additional teams, right? It doesn't matter what league, just adding a new uh, professional team, right, to the city, that if there's these positive externalities that exist, the result will be that instead of too few games, we have too few professional teams in the city. And then I have to go back because I skipped one, right, which is what if we have negative externalities, right? So what if building this stadium, I kind of set it up as like, here's all these good things that could occur. Well, what's some negative externalities that might exist? Well, a negative externality is essentially just, if it's not an additional benefit, it's not positive, it's an additional cost to society. Or it's a cost to somebody who isn't either a consumer or a producer in that market. Okay. So a lot of times we think about like nuclear power, like, you know, there's, once we, uh, you know, have these nuclear power plants built, people who aren't even using the power it generates or aren't purchasing the you know, electricity from the power it generates or, or the people supplying it, other people in that area may have some negative effects of this you know, nuclear waste that they might have to be storing in, you know, in a nearby area. Right? So even if I'm not involved in the market, I have this additional cost to society or pollution is another common one. So for our example, thinking about building a stadium in a city, you know, we can think about maybe the, the stadium gets more congested on those days. Maybe it brings in for certain, you know, businesses, it brings in a certain type of clientele that you know, they doesn't necessarily uh, add to the kind of uh, the atmosphere around their location, right? I mean, people are, are being too rowdy around the stadium and I'm trying to do a fine dining restaurant. That's not going to work out as well, right? Um, but yeah, congestion costs in terms of there's additional costs to, to the traffic from that day. And, you know, for each individual, they're losing out not only on, you know, they don't bear the cost of just, you know, the frustration, like kind of loss in utility from being sitting in traffic, but they also potentially lose out on money if it takes them longer to get to work and they can't, you know, not as productive in that day because they weren't able to be, you know, working as long. So you can kind of imagine there potentially could be some negative externalities to having a stadium in your, in your city as well. If that's the case, what's that going to look like? So make this big again. So we're gonna have a similar kind of setup. We'll kind of choose the number of games, but like I, I mentioned earlier, we could really think about this as the number of teams in a city as well. So we've got, well, we've got our supply curve, we've got our private demand curve or our private marginal benefit. And I think the way I wrote this, a lot of the times I write this, uh, so this is the, I wrote kind of society's marginal benefit here. I probably will more likely notate it like this, marginal, marginal social benefit. And it's probably how I, I think I set it backwards there, so I wrote it backwards. But usually it's, I'll say as the marginal social benefit as opposed to the marginal private benefit here. So here we're gonna have some additional costs. So at any number of games, we're gonna think about that very first game there's gonna be some additional costs, right? So what that's essentially gonna do is means that our society's marginal cost curve or the marginal social cost, which is gonna be the private marginal cost plus this negative externality that exists. Well, what that's gonna do is the, the market will decide this is kind of our optimal number of games. But for society, they would have set the number of games where the marginal benefit is equal to the society's kind of marginal cost or, or the marginal social cost. So you can see here for society, it would actually be better to have a fewer number of games. So if there's a lot of negative externalities that exist, 
the private market arrives at a number of games that is greater than what's socially desired. You can kind of see what I was doing here, right? At the very first game, society's costs are going to be higher, right? And that's how we kind of get that, that uh, marginal social cost curve. Oops. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. So we kind of do that quick review of externalities. Let's think about, oh, there we go. So we already went through positive externalities. We could have an example where there exists both, right? So let's say if we have positive and negative externalities existing, you know, for a city when these sports games are, sport games are being played. Can we think about what can we say about the current equilibrium number of games or what can we say about the kind of current price of, of games, right? Well, we talked about the number of games, but if we think about the price paid per game, when there was negative externalities, right, the price per game kind of would have been right here. Right? But then when we, kind of factor in where society would want it, they would actually like the price for these games to be higher. Right? And then with our positive externalities, right, we could do the same thing where society would have wanted the equilibrium price to be set higher as well. So here we have kind of both of these externalities drawn separately. I honestly think this is probably the easiest way to think about what would happen if we had both of them occurring at the same time. So when we had this negative externality, that meant that the number of games was too high and price was set too low. Oh, hold on. <laughs> it would help if you could see what I'm writing, right? So the games were were set too high above the socially optimal point, and the price was set lower than the, the optimal point. For the positive externality, I'll kind of try to write this in the same, same sheet so we have everything there. The number of games being played was too low, right? So we think about for the positive, sorry, for the positive externalities, These were the effects that we have. And for the negative externality, here was the impacts we had. And if we go back to the positive externality, the price was also set lower than what was socially optimal, right? So if we have both of these occurring at the same time, both of these externalities are gonna be driving the price lower than what is socially optimal. So if we think about the total effect, Think about here kind of the total effect. The number of games being played, sorry, the price being paid per game will definitely be too low, right? Because both those externalities are going to cause that. However, the, both externalities are occurring at the same time. They're both kind of pushing the number of games in different directions. So the number of games being played, kind of it's indeterminate, right? About whether or not it's going to be too high or too low or higher than or lower than what's socially optimal, right? Because these externalities are, are pushing the number of games in opposite directions. Right? So when we go back to those options, I think the only one that's gonna make sense for us is that it's gonna cause the price in the market that's being paid per game to be lower than what is socially optimal or too low. Right? Any questions on that? I know I was kind of switching back and forth. You know, you could draw these at the same time, right? And then, what's going to affect if the number of games being played is too high or too low is really just, am I drawing one of these shifts larger than the other? Is the negative externality larger than the positive externality? Because if the positive externality is larger than the negative externality, then we know that this is the effect that's going to dominate and that we're going to end up at a number of games that's lower than socially optimal. Now, if the negative externality is larger, that's going to shift my, my kind of cost curve more. And so then I know that that's the effect that's going to take over because the negative externality is larger. We'll end up at a number of games that are, are, too, are higher than what's socially optimal. Okay. 
Any questions on that? Let me make sure I check the chat here. Okay. So that's kind of what we got going on with these, these externalities. So let's think about kind of how this applies to cities, right? So if we have positive externalities that exist to cities, stadiums potentially bring in more people from outside the city, kind of increasing the exports, local businesses, I've already mentioned these, might see demand increases on the days that games are being played, brings in new jobs, I mean, just directly, right? There's gonna be more people working at the stadium, even if that means like in their marketing department, I had a friend once actually that worked for the, uh, in the marketing department for the Bulls. And like, there's a lot of people, <laughs> like, like they hire a pretty, pretty big number of people there. So, you know, all these other positive effects that could exist um, is this revenue that's being generated, this additional revenue from having the stadium, right? If we could add it all up, all the direct and indirect revenue, is it worth it for the city maybe to kind of, bid to give a little bit of money to help build the stadium, right? What's the true value, okay? So um, if we look at a lot of the studies that are out there, does this actually bring in enough revenue? Well, a lot of them find no, but then the answer could be like maybe that there is some boost. Um, we'll talk through a couple of the findings, but the short answer is when we look at the data, a lot of these stadiums being built in the city if we compare that city's revenues to other similar weekends when there aren't being games played in the city, right? It's not any different. There's no statistically significant difference there. So we see some evidence that maybe there's employment increases, but when we try to look at revenue generated by businesses, like usually they focus on hotel businesses or a hotel chains, because if anything, that's where we should see an increase, right? Because it's gonna be bringing more people into the city and they need somewhere to stay. The short answer is we don't find a lot of significant effects there because if there wasn't a team there, right? If they didn't build this stadium, they would have went kind of the ne the next best thing, or or potentially um, could have been something that was even better than having the stadium. Like maybe they build, um, you know, an art museum instead, and that brings in a lot of additional people, and that generates revenue for the you know the the businesses around the uh, art museum. So just because we have a team, you got to think about, well, what would you have had in that location other than a stadium? Maybe it would have been additional restaurants and bars, right? What is it replacing? So just because you see, you know, area, uh, the businesses nearby generating more revenue, well, they might've been generating even more revenue if instead of a stadium that had simply just been apartments or living space, right? So it's kind of hard to think about this just because we see increases in revenue. What would the increase, what would the increase have been if it wasn't a stadium, but something else, right? What else or whatever would have replaced a stadium? Um, I was actually just talking to a student. You know, you can think about, especially when we think about this in not professional sports, if we think about like minor league, a lot of these minor league teams are in smaller cities. And potentially if they didn't have a team, maybe they couldn't get anything. You know, who wants to put an art museum in uh, Fort Wayne? I don't know. I mean, maybe someone, but, but, but right, they, they have enough demand to have kind of a local kind of minor league team. Right? I think there's a team in Fort Wayne. If not Fort Wayne, choose one or the other kind of cities of similar size that she's, uh, has, a, has a team. South Bend is another good example. But um, this is, I was thinking about the students that they had. And like I said, we're talking about a lot of things in, in uh, the context of sports, but it really works the same with any leisure activity. Like, and I say leisure activity, any, uh, some, something that someone would do for, for leisure, for fun or visit. So they got a job at um, Buffalo Bill Museum, which is out in Wyoming, kind of near Yellowstone. And it's like, they got a bunch of um, like old kind of like 1800s, Wild West kind of kind of artifacts and kind of the history of the area. But it's in a town, I think it's, I think the town's called Cody and it's like 10,000 people. That museum wasn't in that area what else would there be, right? Why else would anyone else go there? So a smaller city is probably more likely to see increases in revenue from having these stadiums or museums. Whereas the larger cities, well, if we don't have an NFL stadium, guess what? Maybe, maybe we have an NBA stadium, or maybe we have you know, whatever, you know, some other sport or some other you know, large museum or something that brings people in. Okay? So when we're thinking about professional sports, we're mainly thinking about these larger cities, right? They have lots of options. So what are some of the impacts that these stadiums could have on income? Maybe it boosts local income. Kind of already mentioned, you know, the people that are working at nearby areas. 
you know, definitely if we want to look at overall kind of income measures, just the player salaries of the players living in that city are going to boost it. But kind of the, you know, construction workers or anyone else that's involved in, in building the stadium, maybe we see a boost initially in, in local income. Potentially, it's not going to benefit everyone identically, right? So just because, you know, we have this new stadium being built, well, if, if having a stadium near my business isn't a good thing, potentially I'll see the reverse effect, right? I kind of I mentioned like a fine dining restaurant being located right across from, you know, an NFL stadium. Maybe that's not the greatest thing for them. Right? So um, how much additional revenue is, is the additional money being brought into the state or into the city going to have on what's the total effect going to have on the city? Well, that kind of depends on how much money people are going to spend of that additional income, right? So the marginal propensity to consume is the proportion of my income that I will then spend, right? So if my income comes, goes up by $10,000, but I only spend 9,000, right? Or I only spend 90% of my, my income, excuse me, I save the other 10%. Well, not that whole 10, sorry. <clears throat> the entirety of that additional $10,000 doesn't get, back, get put back into the economy of the city, right? Only 9,000 does. So the marginal propensity to consume is gonna, gonna matter. And then the marginal propensity to import is gonna matter as well, right? So the marginal propensity to import is the proportion of my income I spend outside of that city. So even if the income of all these local restaurant kind of construction workers goes up, if they don't live in the city and they spend a large proportion of their money outside of the city, well, that's not going to have any impact on the revenue of the city itself, right? So just because we see income go up in the city, it, it matters where, how much of and where people are spending that additional income. Right? So we have this multiplier effect, <clears throat> which is that every additional dollar that's generated in the city is going to then, you know, be used to purchase something else, which whoever I, I buy that from is gonna be used to purchase something else, right? So there's gonna be a multiplier effect. And what that multiplier effect is, is gonna depend on that marginal propensity to consume. So notice here, if I'm subtracting this, if I subtract a proportion, so it has to be somewhere between zero and one, so if I subtract that from one, I'm gonna be dividing by a smaller number. So as the marginal propensity to consume goes up, this multiplier effect will also go up, right? And it kind of is, it truly makes sense, not just through the mathematics, but if I consume a lot of my income, right? Then there's more money going out into that city's economy. So as that marginal propensity consume gets closer and closer to one, this multiplier effect is gonna increase quite a bit. Similarly, but kind of on the flip side, if the marginal propensity to import goes up, that means I'm spending a larger proportion of my income outside the city, then I would be adding a certain, you know, some number here. If I add a number to this denominator, it gets larger. When I divide by a larger value, that decreases the multiplier. Once again, intuitively, that makes sense. If my marginal propensity to import, I'm spending more money outside the city, then these income increases aren't gonna have near as large of a multiplier effect on the city itself, right? Because more of that money is being spelt, spent in the suburbs or nearby towns, okay? So this is how we could de determine the multiplier effect. I probably won't do a ton with like the computation, um, but just thinking about how the changes in these two things will impact that multiplier effect. Okay? So if we want to think about, okay, we've got stadium workers and maybe kind of um, the actual players, they're both going to have, you know, they're both going to see higher incomes potentially from having this new stadium. So let's say we think about the, the players themselves, right? Well, they're seeing a rather large amount of, of money, right? Their, their salaries are pretty high. But what do you think is true about the marginal propensity to consume for the player relative to the marginal propensity to consume for a stadium worker? So if I'm trying to compare this marginal propensity to consume, and we'll call it kind of for our player, and we want to compare that to the marginal propensity to consume for 
kind of a standard stadium worker, which of these do you think might have a higher marginal propensity to consume? Probably the stadium worker, right? I mean, lower income classes just don't even have the luxury or the opportunity to like save money, right? If, if, if you only have enough money to, to purchase the kind of bare essentials, not that a stadium worker is just doing that, but as we're getting closer to that point, you'd probably think that, you know, I don't know, maybe the marginal propensity to consume for the stadium worker is something like 0.9. And at the player, right, making that, I mean, they do spend a lot of money, like the level is high, but they have to kind of prepare for life after they, they get out of, of whatever sport they're in. They're likely putting a lot of that money aside. And so, you know, we would think their marginal propensity to consume is going to be something that's a little bit lower. Right? So if we don't think about, let's say they, both of them spend all of their money in the city just for a second. So if we think about the multiplier for each dollar of income that these two different types of people have, the multiplier for the player right, is going to be what? One over one minus 0.6. So that's what? 0.4. So I think I'm doing my math in my head correctly there. 2.5. Right? Whereas for the, the stadium worker, one over one minus 0.9, it's going to have a much larger kind of multiplier effect. Every additional dollar that the stadium workers paid brings an additional $10 to the, to the city, whereas every additional dollar the player gets, it's only going to bring, bring an additional two and a half. Right? Now we have this other thing that gets factored in as well, which is the marginal propensity to import. So if you think about this marginal propensity to import for the player, versus that of, of our, our stadium worker here. Which one do you think probably has a higher marginal propensity to import? It's not really a right or wrong answer here. Who do you think is more likely to spend a larger proportion of their money outside of that city the team plays in? Probably the player. I mean, even if we just look at housing locations, a lot of these players may live, hell, some of them might live in a different city completely, right? Somewhere else in the country. So, you know, they're likely spending a much higher proportion. So it's probably something like, um, I don't know, let's just do 0.1 versus 0.2, right? They're, they're more likely to spend a higher proportion of their income somewhere else, right? Or they're importing to the city. And then we could like kind of factor those in and, and, and calculate the multipliers. But all that means is that we're now adding a larger value for the player. So that's going to make the denominator larger, which then is going to reduce that multiplier even more. So both of these things kind of impact that multiplier and that we would likely expect that multiplier effect for each additional dollar a player earns to be much, much lower than the additional dollar given to those stadium ones. Any questions on, on this? We're okay with this? All right. So um, we kind of already talked through this. So what does the research say? Um, I think we'll look at one of these papers on Thursday just to kind of give you some additional, I, I think I, I said I'll use it to, to go through and kind of teach you a little bit or, or show you some features of Google Scholar kind of looking for, for you know, building your literature review, looking for other Play or uh, people or researchers that have, have done something similar to your idea. So several papers find that basically when we're looking at income measures and the number of jobs, that there's really looks like there's no impact on the cities. Okay. It looks like that when these new stadiums are built or when a team relocates, a lot of time we don't see this boost in income or in the number of jobs. Okay. However, there's kind of a more recent paper, I say recent, I mean, not too long ago, that found that there are positive effects on per capita income where minor league baseball stadiums go. So this was the idea we talked about earlier that it's likely that there weren't going to be additional opportunities if that stadium, that minor league stadium wasn't built in that area. There wasn't going to be anything that would replace it. While as in the larger kind of professional leagues, the cities that they're located in, there's always something that will kind of replace that. And you don't see near as 
kind of a much of a difference to when that stadium's there or when it's not. Uh, there was also one that kind of tried to look at this for, they, they was like a case study. They specifically looked at Columbus. And what they found was um, that home values actually uh, are impacted by this as well. So if by college football stadiums, the, the further you get from them, um, the home prices start to decline. At least I say, I say that's, they did this just in Columbus. So this, this could, you know, if we looked at every single city, this may not be true. But at least there's some findings that, you know, maybe there's some positive effects, not just in like local bars and restaurants, but also just on real estate, right? The value of a home. All right. So I wanted to bring this up because I think it's kind of a, it's kind of a unique um, example or some unique data. But basically when Seattle built their, their NFL stadium, the last, I forget what year it was. I probably have it. I mean, I think, I feel like I want to say 2012, but I feel like that's wrong. And I don't have the year, whatever it was, not too long ago. You know, a lot of these districts, they, they had Seattle uh, citizens or residents vote on this referendum about whether or not they wanted to raise taxes to give some money to the uh, Seattle Seahawks to locate in this one specific area. So, you know, taxes were going to be on things like tickets and parking, uh, tickets and parking. Um, they had a tourist tax for like other you know, nearby kind of tourist, uh, you know, maybe like a art museum or something like that. And then also hotel room taxes. So you can kind of tell these taxes are all really trying to focus on not the people living in Seattle, but the people who are coming there to visit, right? So the idea behind this is, all right, we'll tax these things that people out who don't live here would have to use. We'll generate all this additional money in taxes. And then we can promise Seattle that we'll use that tax money and we'll give that to them so that they, you know, agree to locate in our city. So, um, oh, they also had some kind of, they were going to tax lotteries because it's always easy to tax lottery. Um, but there was some potential controversy in that. What they were going to do is previously all these, the taxes on, on all these different lotteries was going to education. And part of this referendum was now they were going to use some of that money that was going to education to promise the team so that they would build their stadium in Seattle. So this part people didn't like, right? This looks good. Let's tax people who are coming to our city. This part, well, we don't want to take money away from our city's education, right? But that was all kind of wrapped up into one referendum. So if we look at the voting, so where's this star at? So this star is where they were going to kind of, um, the, the old kind of stadium was. So there was, an, uh, I forget what, Quest Field. I'm guessing this is going to be the baseball stadium, but you can kind of see that near they're going to build near the stadium. All the people that were kind of voting yes on this referendum, right? So voting yes, the the white is like nobody, right? And then black would be like everyone in the county is voting yes, right? So these really light shaded areas that are kind of nearby the city, right? They're not these areas weren't close enough maybe to get the um, you know, benefits of being right next to the stadium. And so nobody here is kind of voting that they wanted to do this, right? But there, there, there's not a lot of, you know, any of the negative externalities that existed, potentially they were going to feel the, the strongest effects of. And then out here away from the stadium, notice, yeah, these people don't care. They experience none of the negative externalities in terms of traffic or kind of bringing more people around their home because they're, I guess, I, I'm guessing this is uh or what river would this be? I don't know. They, they live on the other side, right? They're, they're far enough away that they're not going to experience those ne negative externalities. So of course they don't care if we kind of put this referendum and allow this, this stadium to be here, right? But the people that are living kind of closer to this stadium, you know, think that they're going to maybe experience some of those, those negative externalities. And so we saw a, a much smaller percent vote yes. Right? So it's kind of a, a unique, and I don't, you know, broken down by kind of, uh, all these were, aren't counties. I don't know what you would call within the city, these little districts, right? So they, they kind of graph out what that effect is. And, and sure enough, what they find is as you get, and I had to, couldn't get rid of it because I had to copy and paste this from the actual article that I didn't pay for. Um, but driving distance from the stadium is what's on the x-axis here. So the probability that you voted yes, as you move further from the stadium, you start to 
initially, as they get further from the stadium, you're more likely to vote yes, right? Because you're close enough where you can experience some of the positive externalities, but not close enough where you maybe are getting some of the negative ones. And then as you move further and further away, well now for sure at certain miles, right, the negative externalities don't exist to you. If I'm 20 miles away from the stadium, there's likely no negative externalities. But I also, as I get further away, I'm not gonna be seeing any of the positive externalities either. So it's kind of this, you know, nice little U-shaped curve that kind of is being impacted by both these negative and positive externalities. And then we see a similar thing. Um, I forget, they, they did something to make it a little bit tighter here. I think it was, uh, oh, if I remember right, what they did was somehow compared areas that were the same distance away but I forget the argument was one of the areas they said wouldn't have experienced as strong of negative externalities. Something about the way that Seattle is constructed where like the East would have been impacted less than the West. I, I can't remember exactly what it was um, they were compared, but it was something along those lines. So they could get a little bit tighter of estimates and sure enough, they find kind of a very similar effect, right? Initially being further, you start to be more likely to vote. And then at a certain point, you're far enough away to where, why am I paying potentially additional taxes to you know, build this stadium that will have no positive externalities to me. Okay. So I don't know. It's kind of a, kind of an interesting um, little finding. I want to make sure I. Where are we at on time? So I want to make sure we get through this. We can talk about some of this next week or on a Thursday. But uh, th this I'm gonna kind of go go by pretty quick or go through pretty quick. It's it's nothing. That I'm not necessarily going to focus on kind of with it with an exam question or something. So, you know, one thing that we have seen, you know, with this idea of the positive extra and negative externalities exist, a lot of um, stadiums have been moving away from being downtown. And the reason why we can think about if I'm further from downtown, those negative ex externalities of like additional congestion and things likely aren't going to have as large of an impact on the suburb as, as they would, you know, immediately downtown New York City, right? Can you imagine they tried to build a stadium like right next to Times Square? Like a lot of businesses are going to be pretty pissed about that, right? So, you know, there's been kind of this movement to stadiums moving away from downtown. Um, you know, kind of the reasoning why is behind, well, you know, a lot of these old downtown facilities that were built, um, over time, right? Those, those areas typically be, or start to be the ones that decay. Whereas, you know, kind of the, the people with money start to kind of move, right, towards, so that, uh, towards, you know, the suburbs and things like that. And so we've seen a movement of the stadiums out that way as well. Uh, but like I said, I'm not going to focus too much on this because there's not going to be too much of a question, but we do see that, that happening. So one thing I wanted to, to mention with these public goods is government involvement, right? So I'm mentioning that Seattle is trying to raise taxes and trying to get additional money so that they can promise it to Seattle so Seattle will choose to locate in their team in Seattle, right? So, all right. So we talked about these positive externalities. If we think that the positive externalities are really great, right? then, well, it's not really fair. Like, first of all, society's at a point where we're, we're not playing enough games or we don't have enough sports teams. We can think about it that way. So we know that, you know, even if I played the same number of games, the benefits that exist to society are much higher. So as long as I'm just telling society, you have to pay this additional amount in taxes, well, that'd be okay. They'll kind of get back down to, to, to the price they would have paid. So to get the private marginal benefit curve to match up with um, the marginal social benefit curve, what I can do is think about, I'll take my original demand curve that just has the marginal benefits, and I'll try to kind of create kind of this, this subsidy. Right? So I'll pay this team some additional money so that I get the team to have a Kind of marginal benefit curve that matches society's marginal benefit curve. So if I subsidize these teams, they're going to choose to locate in my city 
and then play the optimal number of games, right? So you can almost think about this as, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm a team and I'm trying to think about, I've got like 10 different cities I could locate to, right? And I look here and I'm like, well, demand at least has to be high enough such that in that city, it would make sense to play, you know, for an NFL team, eight games there, right? If demand wasn't high enough, right? Originally, like demand wasn't high enough. Let's say that this was six. Well, I'd have to play eight games in that city, right? <laughs> As an NFL team. And so the only way in which this city can uh, attract me to locate there is if they can subsidize me being there such that I end up playing the full eight games, but the only way I, I can do that is I'm getting this additional benefit or this additional subsidy. And so this a subsidy is really just going to come in the form of the, the you know, city promising like all these tax, all this tax money, this is earmarked for you, right? The, the hotel tax increase and all this, all that additional tax revenue will be, will be go to help support kind of you paying off this stadium. So they're going to subsidize these different stadiums. Okay. So with that public good, you know, it makes sense if we want to get the, the number up, we'll, we'll subsidize that good. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through the, uh, we'll talk about this stuff on Thursday. Uh, I want to get down to, uh, where was it? I know I had something in here about it. Not stadium financing. Oh, here we go. I just wanted to kind of look at some of these, um, some of these numbers, right? So when we think about these subsidies that the cities are going to offer, first of all, see if I can get this to get a couple of resources here that I want to take a look at because it's really interesting. Um, you can always rely on, I used to always be able to rely on dead spin. It's a little bit, not quite the same, same as it used to be, but here was an old thing they put out. It's a really cool little graphic. Yeah, this is going to, I don't want to see all this. Okay. So we're going to start looking at the percent of stadiums that were paid by the team and then how much of it was subsidized. So you can kind of think about the red here, right? It was a hundred percent coming from the teams, hundred percent private. Anytime you see these more of these blue dots, it's going to be a hundred percent was subsidized, right? By that city where it was basically paid for by the public. So you kind of notice once it resets, We'll start out in 1914. All the teams are private. Then more and more start to be provided by public. And then over time to more recently, it's kind of this mix, right? So it started out completely being funded by the teams. Then cities started to say, well, look, we got it. We're going to entice these teams to locate in our city. We'll offer these huge kind of subsidies to them. And then over time they realize, well, that actually doesn't always work and keep the team there. And so now it's usually been a kind of a mix of the two. Okay. So, Let's look at some of those actual numbers because it is, is kind of interesting. Actually, you can kind of see, I'll, I'll point out some ones that are important, but if we look at like NFL stadiums. Um, I think this was only through 2012, but uh, there wasn't anything in 2012. So we've got most of the recent stadiums that were, have, been, have been built and they're arranged by the year in which they were built. So we go back to the oldest one we have here. You can kind of see the percent that the public was paying for some of these teams that built a, a stadium quite a while ago, there's a lot of 100% here, right? There's a lot of these stadiums that were being funded by the public. Right? When we look at more recent stadiums, there, there's, you know, Indianapolis was 100%, New Orleans was pretty close. But you start seeing, like, in the early 2000s, we go away from seeing a lot of these 100% to cities aren't worth to, or aren't willing to pay quite as much as they used to. Right? They aren't willing to subsidize quite as much. And maybe that's because some of the research that has been coming out is there really aren't these, these huge additional benefits coming into your city like we thought there were, right? And so if there aren't these additional positive externalities, the amount of the subsidy I'm going to offer, well, the closer that marginal social benefit curve gets to private marginal benefit, the lower the subsidy I would, ha I would you know, be willing to pay. And you guys see though, there are some interesting ones, even, uh, the, the one in New York actually is completely private, which is, is, is pretty, pretty unique. Um, and then even the one in Boston is, is pretty low, right? So if we look at some of the other leagues, um, kind of see a, a similar trend. Uh, it's not quite as evident if we look at Major League Baseball. 
but there are quite a few where there's they're getting you know 17 12 really low percent of the stadium is being paid for by the public and then if we look at you can kind of look at uh, major league soccer you know we kind of have a lot more variation there um and it does it varies city to city right uh, what was the other one nba so you can kind of see in the nba um they had kind of an opposite trend where there was initially not a lot of cities <laughs> giving them any any subsidy amounts and then maybe over in the recent recent history we've seen a few more that are, are paid paid lar a larger percent is paid by the kind of taxpayer payer dollar okay so that's just some of the trends that exist so i know i'm going to hop around a little bit but i think this is the yeah this is the one slide i want so who you know if we want to give these teams subsidies to locate in our city how are we generating that money? Usually it's through taxes. So who should we tax, right? Well, the goal is we want to set an, an efficient sales tax, right? So that we minimize deadweight loss, okay? Um, now the problem is we really should only be using a sales tax if we have negative externalities that exist, right? And we can kind of push the private marginal kind of benefit curve closer to the, uh, sorry, private marginal cost curve closer to the marginal social cost curve. So the size of the, of the tax that we can charge is gonna depend on the elasticity of demand. So come back to this in a second. And this isn't, you know, elasticity can be different at different points of the demand curve, but I'll draw kind of the, an extreme example where we can think of it as, as being synonymous, synonymous with slope just for the sake of, of this discussion. So let's say, I've got any good. I don't know what this could be. Oh, what good could we think about here? So let's say I've got my supply curve and I've got a pretty, pretty elastic demand curve, right? So I would say this is kind of, we're thinking about a fairly elastic demand curve in that if I'm thinking about changes in price here, if I change the price even a little bit, it changes the quantity demanded by a hell of a lot, right? So if I, if I increase prices a little bit here, it changes quantity demanded by a lot, right? So if I tax this good, and I probably should have drawn this to, to match up here. Actually, let me, let me redraw this. So I wanna make sure I, those, I think those lines are gonna confuse us when I do the next thing I wanna do. So we've got the price here, pretty inelastic demand curve, we'll go supply here. Right? So previously, we were at this kind of coin, call this Q1 and P1. So I said it's pretty elastic, which means it's pretty responsive to price changes. Well, let's say I add this tax, what's that gonna do? it actually shifts my supply curve backwards, right? And if, here's, here's, we can think about why. At any given quantity, it's now not just the private marginal cost, right? It's not just the marginal cost of producing that good. It's that cost plus the amount of the tax. So you can almost think about the difference in these two lines is really just whatever the tax value is, right? whatever the amount of the tax is. So the problem is, well, here, what is this tax done? Well, now producers will decide that, you know, I'm not, I can't produce at this point anymore. With these additional costs, it's really like taxes are like raising input costs. I'm gonna decrease the amount that I'm producing. And we can think about where we'll, what was lost, right? This entire area was deadweight loss, right? So we're thinking about this blue area here. This was our deadweight loss. Well, what if we had had a pretty inelastic good, right? What would kind of be, you know, think about what would be lost to society from that? And um, actually, I want to identify one more thing before we switch to that. So the number of units sold and the difference between kind of these two supply curves was the value of the tax. This green shaded area would represent how much tax revenue we earned, right? Every unit sold 
times the value of the tax, which was just the difference in our supply curves there. So what if instead we had a pretty inelastic demand curve? Everybody okay if I kind of switch from this? Good. So what if I had had a pretty inelastic demand curve? Like I said, it's not completely synonymous with slope, but we can think about it for the sake of this point. So let's say I've got an inelastic demand curve that looks something like, I'm gonna draw it really extreme. All right, so we've got this really, really inelastic demand curve, which means that as I change my price, right, even by a lot, it's not gonna change the quantity demanded purchase very much. Now, this is the idea of like insulin, right? Um, I know someone has a dog that has insulin, right? It doesn't matter what the price of insulin is. If it goes up by five or $10, they're still gonna buy the insulin for their dog probably, right? So we've got our supply curve. What happens if we, and I'll try to draw a similar, I'm gonna to try to draw it to scale. I'm gonna to try to draw the exact same tax, right? The exact same, same amount. So if I compare this to my other one, it should be pretty close to kind of drawing the same shift, right? So I add that tax in, we'll think about what happened in this market. Well, previously I was here. After the tax was imposed, right, and think about from here, right? So where's the dead weight loss? Well, man, oh, sorry. I, this looks like a S. This should, was, I meant for that to be a two. Um, well, I mean, look at this. I mean, we barely saw any reduction in quantity. My dead weight loss here is very small compared to what it was when I taxed an elastic good or a good that was had a pretty elastic demand. Once again, the tax revenue generated is the difference between kind of my two supply curves, that represents the value of the tax times the number of units I sold. So we end up with a pretty sizable, whoops, sizable amount of government revenue and additional revenue without costing society too much, right? Without creating large deadweight loss, losses. Okay, any questions on that? Now, obviously like, we can generate more revenue without hurting society for inelastic goods. But a lot of the times, maybe inelastic goods aren't things we want to tax. Like we don't want to tax people who need insulin, right? Like, we're like yeah, we can generate a lot of revenue, but like, it's not, it's not, you know, that's not good. So let's start to think about who we should tax. What, what kind of items should we target? We know that we want them to be inelastic, but we also want this to be kind of a fair tax. So what's something else that might be inelastic that's really easy to convince society to tax. Yeah. Tobacco taxes are, yeah, are easy, right? No one really argues against it. It's pretty inelastic, so you can generate a lot of revenue, right? But, you know, is it fair? I don't know. I mean, you're choosing to use it. You know, I guess you're choosing to use it. You're choosing to pay the higher price. But usually things that we think of as like bad products we call them sin taxes. They're really easy to tax those goods. So like alcohol, tobacco, lotteries, or like a recent one where like states can realize like, yeah, just increase the taxes on, on, on casinos and, and things like that. And people don't really care. Any questions kind of on any of this or any comments or, okay. So go back here. So, um, you know, the same increase, you know, the same, amount of taxes, we kind of already saw, I, I drew it out for us here, right? It's gonna have a much greater effect on the quantity sold if we have an inelastic good relative to an elastic good. But then it comes into play with who should we be taxing, right? V vertical and horizontal equity, okay? So vertical equity refers to that we're taxing people more that have a greater ability to pay, right? So essentially we're taxing people who have more money a higher amount. 
So that's vertical equity, right? The people with a greater ability to pay are gonna be the ones that pay the most. Probably the best example in our everyday lives is income taxes, right? If you have a higher ability to pay, you're gonna end up paying a higher percent of your income. So that's a pretty common one. Um, property taxes are another one that, that really is using vertical, vertical equity. So we wanna make sure that we're taxing people who have a higher ability to pay the most. Horizontal equity is I'm gonna tax people who will benefit the most from whatever those tax dollars are gonna be spent on. So if I'm thinking about this in the context of my stadium, I wanna to try to target people with these taxes who are most likely to be using the stadium, right? So that's why hotel taxes, um, parking taxes, right? Trying to put taxes on things that people who wanna to go to the stadium attend the games coming from outside the city, that they're more likely to use those products, right? So a lot of times we kind of see, um, you know, one of the ones I always use, not just stadiums, they'll put taxes on, I think I said it in the earlier one, but I forget what they call it. It's like a leisure tax or something. And uh, what's the, is it Gurney Mills right outside of Chicago that has six flags? Their, their tax is significantly higher um, if you go to the gas station outside of uh, uh, the uh, amusement park as opposed to as soon as you go to, to buy something inside of it, right? So there's very different taxes um, you can kind of play around with. So you make sure that, you know, maybe the concessions in a stadium get taxed more than just food bought outside the stadium or something like that. So horizontal equity, you're trying to target the people who you think are going to be using the good that the tax dollars are going to pay for. Vertical equity, you just want to make sure people who are, have more money or have a higher ability to pay are the ones who are, are being taxed a little more. Okay. So I already mentioned hotel taxes are probably the most popular, right? You know, once you, you know, they're, they're kind of getting at horizontal equity, right? Probably, you know, people who are actually able to stay in the city maybe have more money. So you're kind of getting at vertical equity probably with this as well. Um, you know, the hotels don't like this, right? The hotels don't like this tax because doesn't matter if it's inelastic or elastic. We'll use the, the elastic one just to show this. So if I'm a, let's say we're thinking about the quantity of, of rooms here from a hotel. Um, and, and we may have to change our supply curve to be a little more vertical, but the, the general idea is why would these hotels not like these taxes? Well, notice before, if we didn't have this tax, I'll try to use in the black market to identify, producer surplus would have been the price or the area below price and above the marginal cost. So this entire area was producer surplus before. Now, after the tax, where is producer surplus? Well, they receive this price, but part of that price they have to pay the tax. So this is gonna be new producer surplus, right? You can kind of think about it as up here, this point is going to be kind of the price that the sellers get to keep, or sorry, yeah, the price the sellers get to keep plus the tax, right? So then they have to pay the tax. The price the sellers actually get to keep is all the way down here. So the producers are going to see a huge decrease in their surplus, so they really, you know, they don't like these taxes, right? But they are horizontally, you know, equitable and probably, you know, getting at some vertical equity there, there as well. We already talked about sin taxes. These are really easy to tax because, you know, there's not a lot of pushback and they're also very inelastic, right? Um, you know, and some people think, you know, also if we can, even if they're inelastic, if I can reduce the quantity of cigarettes used at all, that's a good thing for society. I'm not saying that one way or the other, um, but a lot of people, you know, will also kind of have a pushback to these sin taxes and push more for the hotel taxes because, you could actually argue that a lot of these sin taxes are not vertically equitable, right? So if we look at the numbers, a larger percent of people in the lowest income brackets use alcohol, tobacco at higher rates, right? So if you're taxing these goods that you know that the lower socioeconomic classes are using more often, not really vertically equitable by doing that. 
Um, I think this is, I'm talking about bonds here. We might kind of stop the discussion here for today and I'll, I'll rearrange the slides so that we can kind of go through them in order next class. But I did want to talk about kind of taxes and what that looks like. So one more thing I want to go through is, um, so I already mentioned all these, we'll do the stadium financing. Okay, so I wanna do one more thing to think about. So if we have these, um, if we have these taxes and they're, and they're gonna be used to kind of pay for these stadiums. So what if I had kind of my perfect dream scenario, I guess. What if I had a completely inelastic good and I don't know, it was some, one of these sin goods that people don't care if I tax it, right? Because things will get a little bit different. I might kind of use this idea to, to think about how we could generate the most money with taxes. So let's say we've got um, completely, well, we'll draw our supply curve in first. And then let's say I have completely elastic demand, right? So if you change, sorry, not elastic, completely inelastic demand to where if I change the price doesn't matter what price I set, people continue to buy the exact same amount. Right? Well, then if I think about what's the effect of a tax here, right? so here's my supply curve plus the tax, the quantity is exactly the same, right? There's absolutely no dead weight loss. Right? There is a transference of surplus, so prior, to the tax, the price being paid was here. So here was kind of our producer surplus at the area below the price and above the marginal cost curve. But then consumer surplus was really this entire area up here. After the tax, the new price that's paid, right, here's the price that's paid that's gonna be the price the seller keep, gets to keep plus the tax. Now the price the seller gets to keep would be down here. So here's the value of the tax. Here's the number of units I sold. This entire area, which was consumer surplus, now becomes government revenue. There's no dead weight loss. And I've generated a lot of additional revenue, but it was all taken from the consumers. Right? There was no transference of producer surplus here. It was completely from the consumers. Okay. Um, any questions on, on that? Okay. Yeah, that should be good for today. Um, we'll kind of end it there. So we're thinking about these um, ways in which we can entice a, a team to come to our city. Uh, we thought about the effects of taxes. We'll do a little bit more um, work with this on Thursday. I'll walk us through some Google Scholar, but then we'll start doing some review problems in class Thursday as well. We'll continue to do review problems in class next Tuesday, and then we'll have that exam at the end of next week. Okay. Any questions for me before we get out of here? All right, I've had a lot of you reach out too. If you're having, if you're working on the homework assignment and you have questions, um, Feel free to reach out to me as early as possible so we can kind of get a time to meet schedule so you can get through those pretty easily, okay? All right, I'll see you guys Thursday.